steel beam design. If you want to be a structural engineer, you cannot run from it. It's everywhere. I see dead beams. In today's video, we're going to design a steel beam together and we're going to quickly look at lateral restraints, critical flange and a couple of more things that it's important for you to know when designing a steel beam. Having said that, let's get started. A simply supported steel floor beam spans 6 meters and supports 4 meter long joists and a 3 meters high timber framed wall. Select a suitable steel PFC, which is a parallel flange channel, for the loading below. So we've got a timber floor dead load of 0.5 kPa, a timber floor live load of 1.5 kPa, and a timber wall dead load of 0.2 kPa. We don't have any roof loads or wind loads in this exercise. So the wall is 3 meters high, the joy is 4 meters long, and the main beam we're going to design is 6 meters long. This is what a PFC looks like, in case you don't know. And the beam is simply supported and we need to find the loads in kilonewtons per meter. So 0 0.5 kPa for wall, 0 0.2 kPa for, for uh, floor and 0 0.2 for wall. And 0 0.5 times half of the joist span and for the wall is going to be 0 0.2 times the wall height. So we've got a total of 1.6 kN per meter. The live load is 1.5 times half of the joist span. You will have to work out the worst case combinations for your scenario. In my case, I will use 1.2 G plus 1.5 Q for ultimate limit state and G plus 0.7 Q for the serviceability limit state. So ULS is 6.42 kN per meter, which will be assessed for strength, and SLS is 3.7 kN per meter, which will be assessed for deflection. So just emphasizing this, you will have to use one load combination to work out the bending moment capacity, and the other to work out the maximum deflection of the beam. To calculate the design action, we simply use the formula for bending moment, which is moment equals to load times the length squared divided by 8. We've got 28.89 kilonewtons meter. And the deflection limit will be the span divided by 250. You can also check live load divided by 360. And if the wall was made of a brittle material, we can do span divided by 500. So since 24 millimeters is a little too much, we will limit the beam to deflect 12 millimeters. And this number can vary according to the designer assessment. We will also check the beam for dynamic effects. We don't want the floor to bounce when people walk on it. The way we check this is by applying a force of 1 kN in, mid, in the mid span of the beam and limiting this deflection to 1 mm. In order to find the moment capacity of the beam, we will consider it as full lateral restraint by the joists. And by doing so, we can utilize the design section moment capacity phi MSX found on this, uh, on this red book. And I will explain a little bit more about lateral restraint in the end of the video. So the 150 PFC has a section capacity of 37 kilonewtons meters, which is way over than what we need. Let's have a look at deflection now. Because um, most of the times, deflection will govern the design of a beam. So by using this formula for deflection of a simply supported beam 
and substituting the delta for 12 millimeters, which is the maximum deflection, we get a second moment of area required for the beam that we need. That's 26 times 10 to the power of 60. Looking at the one steel book, we find that we need a 230 PFC. So instead of using a 150 PFC, we actually need a 230 PFC. We will do the same process, process to the dynamic calculations. The deflection formula is a little different for a point load, but the concept here is the same. We need to find the I required for a deflection limit of one millimeters and check if the 230 PFC works. So just by looking at the tables again, we find that the 230 PFC actually works. So we're happy with this section and let's run with a 230 PFC. And this ends our beam design. If you want to stick around for a couple more minutes, I will explain you a little bit more about lateral restraint of flexural members, which is very important to know in order to choose the correct tables to select the bending moment capacity. Okay, so in this example, we use the tables for the section moment capacity phi MSX, which is simply the yield stress times the effective sec section modulus. Okay, now if you have a check at 4100 clause 5.3.2.1, you will see that a beam can achieve full lateral restraint by a continuous lateral restraint to the critical flange. Right, and this would be the case of a concrete slab on top of a beam for downward loads or by full or partial restraint provided at sufficient locations along the beam. Intermediate lateral restraints as well. It's missing here, sorry. So the segment length that the segment length that AS4100 refers to is the FRFLR on the table as you can see here and again um, your restraints in the beam needs to be located at this maximum FLR distance so you can use MSX Phi MSX if it's not that distance if it's more than that that distance you cannot use Phi MSX you cannot use the section moment capacity theoretically in our case the joists are spaced 450 centers. Therefore, the bending capacity of the 150 PFC that we chose is in reality less than 37 kilonewton meters because FLR is 422. I simply went ahead with the size because I know it will not change much from 422 to 450. Okay. Um, for instance, a rafter of a portal frame has the purlings, which laterally restrain the top flange for downward loads, and fly brace, which laterally restrain the bottom flange for upward loads. And when you have a fly brace and a purling at the same section, um, you get a fully restrained section. Also, when I mention upward or downward loading, it is for you to know where the critical flange is, and I'll explain what critical flange is in a second. A couple more examples here. A steel beam supporting timber joists in plane. So if the joists are close fitted, close fitted, um, like in this image, the joists can be considered to provide full restraint. Meanwhile, with the joists running on top of the beam, the steel beam might be considered to have lateral restraint at the joist locations where the critical flange is. Um, and as I explained before, the case of purlings and fly bracings um, restraining the flanges. A beam can fail for quite a few reasons. Okay, One of them is yielding. You must have studied that at uni before. Uh, that happens to compact sections and these beams will develop the full cross-section plastic moment and will not buckle. 
It can also fail for local buckling, by local buckling, which happens to non-compact and slender sections. It could fail by lateral torsional buckling. And to explain this a bit more, so when a beam is loaded, one flange goes into compression, which means it is trying to get shorter. This flange will tend to buckle out sideways. Effectively, the flange is behaving like a column. And like a column, the longer it is, the more easily it will buckle. However, the tension flange, right? It, it could be the, the bottom flange if it's a, if there is a downward load, the tension flange does not tend to buckle. So the beam must twist as the compression flange buckles. So you can see here, if I draw a plain view of a beam, it will buckle sideways when loaded. However, if you restrain the beam, like you restrain a column with the floor diaphragm in a building, the effective length reduces. Therefore, the bending capacity increases. Okay? That's why the joists there are important to restrain the beam. Now, when we talk about restraining the beam, we usually mean restraining the critical flange of the beam, which is the flange that in the absence of any restraint would deflect the further during buckling. So in practice, the critical flange is the compression flange for a simply supported beam. And for a cantilever beam, it is the tension flange if the unsupported end is not restrained against lateral movement. But if the tension flange or the whole cross section is prevented from moving sideways, so the compression flange will be the critical flange. Okay. Um, when a beam has closely spaced restraints, which prevent lateral deflection of the critical flange, then these prevent lateral buckling and the beam can be considered to have full lateral restraint. So that's the rule if you want to use the section moment capacity for, for, for the maximum FLR that we explained before. Okay? Otherwise, we have to calculate the effective length of the segment of a beam. And you find these calculations on AS4100 clause 5.6.3. And then you're going to look at these tables for members without full lateral restraint. Okay, so if we look at these tables here, we're going to notice that we're not working with Phi MSX anymore. Now we're using Phi MB which accounts for the effective length that is unrestrained. And you can use that for UBs, UCs, PFCs, or any type of beams. So I hope that wasn't too rushed, guys. I hope you learned something. Um, if, you, if you didn't understand something, just drop a comment below and leave me some comments uh, suggesting some videos or whatever. Show some love. All right, see you next time.